We live in a corrupt world full of bad people who do awful things and are never caught and punished for what they do. So if you heard that a killer was making some of these people pay for all their crimes, how would you feel? Would you want the police to go out and catch them? Would you want this person to be stopped? And just how hard would you be rooting for the police in that case? That's what's going on in our book for this episode, Death Notice. But maybe the more interesting philosophical question would be, does this book have some moral or philosophical depth? Is it pure entertainment? And also, just how much can or should you adapt a work um, in translation for a different market, different readers? That's interesting too. And with me to talk about that is my guest for this episode, Zach Halusa. He's a very interesting guy. We had a very interesting chat. Before we get to that, let's have the true traffic news. So, um, you might have noticed this is a little bit different from the initial upload of the episode. That's because I did a goof. Uh, I had the true traffic news playing right on top of this intro and it sounded uh, horrifying so uh, this, this is a second upload that fixes that problem uh, by the way disclaimer yeah so our first entry in the trichific news it's a new podcast that's come out it's called the southern tour podcast it's by a very cool guy uh, jonathan chatwin and it's all about uh the southern the tour of southern china that deng xiaoping did in the early 90s to try and keep the reform and opening um period of china going keep the stop the economy from flipping back to uh this style it was in under mao zedong so you know whether you find that interesting or not is probably down to you and what you like but i i think i haven't listened to it yet but i think it sounds really cool so i'll be checking that out okay second item on the trichific news is a novel that is now up for pre-order it's strange beasts of china by yang Ge translated by Jeremy Tiang and published by Tilted Axis. Um, now, the the plot, it goes something like this. A young cryptozoologist is sent to in- investigate the lives of like beast-like people who live among us. And along the way, she learns a thing or two about her inner beast, so to speak. So, uh, Knowing Yang Ge, this should be literary and um, amusing and interesting. And yeah, can't can't wait to read it, to be honest. Um, third Church of Fake News item, and I'm just trying to power through these because I'm not enjoying redoing them all, um, is a really interesting academic book that is now up for pre-order. It's called China's Muslims and Japan's Empire. And last time I read the whole blurb, I'll try and summarize it this time. It's a study of... Um, an often overlooked or previously not um, studied aspect of the Japanese kind of imperial or colonial whatever you want to call it rule of um, the parts of China that they conquered uh, before the end of before they lost them again at the end of World War II and it's looking at uh, what Japan was doing in northern and northwestern China to try and win over the Muslim population of China and looking at things like I think it says something like offering an alternative market So trying to win um, the Chinese Muslims over in some economic fashion, but also isolate them from the Soviet Union. So a lot of stuff going on in that book, and the cover is really nice too, by the way. So looks fascinating. Would be quite keen to read that too. That's the Trisha Fake News. Now let's proceed with the interview. Hope you enjoy it. On the show, I've got Zach Halusa. Hi, Zach. How's it going? And what have you been up to? Hi, Angus. Uh, I'm doing fine. I guess as as fine as I can be here in uh, in New York. I guess maybe my most uh, the most recent news on my end. I uh, recently got a new job at uh, Warner Music as a software engineer. Um, so yeah, I've been spending a lot of time behind my computer, which is not really very different from what I usually do. Yeah, I guess a lot of us are behind our computers all day these days. Um, so you, you're also a translator. That's why you're on the show. You, you translated uh, the book that we're doing for this episode, Death Notice. But the fact that you're also working in um, software engineering, computer science makes you a wee bit um, different from other translators I've had on the show. So how, what, what is the story? How did you end up translating uh, this novel? And is it the only novel you've translated or have you done other um, translation uh, work even, even outside the world of like novels? Yeah, I was trying to think of the, uh, the the best way to kind of approach this, since I uh, what I'm what I'm doing right now is uh, I guess not too closely related to translation. Um, I'm wondering if the best way to kind of like 
introduce myself might be uh, just to go back a little bit to uh, when I, I started learning Chinese because uh, what I'm doing now uh, with you know coding, software engineering, that's more of a uh, I guess a recent like career transition. Um, initially, from what would this be? Uh, from 2007 to 2011, uh, that was when I was in college. That was when I first studied uh, Chinese. And during that time, I did have two stints studying abroad in, in China, in, uh, mostly in Beijing and several weeks in Chengdu. Uh, after I graduated from college, uh, from Hamilton College uh, in 2011, I actually moved to China, um, a city near Hangzhou in Shanghai uh, called Jiaxing. And yeah. I was I was working there as an English teacher, but I mean the reason that I was doing it was to uh, continue to really immerse myself in in Chinese and to uh, my my goal at the time it was a very like vague and hazy goal. I just wanted to become a translator. Mm. So I uh, I did take the initial plunge into translation uh, a few years later. Uh, I translated a a short story for a uh, a, a translation contest. Uh, it was. Uh, hosted by I forget which exact branch but it was um, it was affiliated with the Chinese government so it was basically an a very official translation contest uh, right. and the story that I translated was uh, it was by an uh, an author named uh, Hong Ke. Uh, name of the story was uh, Trainio, which I, I translated as uh, shooting the bull it's basically about two friends getting drunk and frolicking on the plains of northern China. Uh, I, I had a lot of fun translating that, uh, mm -hmm. and I was very surprised after submitting it. Uh, it was a long time after submitting it uh, before I heard back, but I found out that it won uh, was third prize in the English category. So that was uh, a very good boost uh, to my confidence, and it also... So it inspired me to actively start seeking some kind of uh, translation work. And I'm sure it also helped when I was trying to promote myself. So long story short, from uh, I guess about that point, that was in 2014. From So from 2014 to about 2018, I was constantly doing some sort of translation. It varied from I started doing art, uh, translating a lot of art criticism. Um, I also translated really a lot of uh, really a lot of various gigs whatever came along it could have been subtitles or brochures i did several uh full length uh, like non-fiction books on chinese art history and wow um but then uh kind of around the the tail end of that maybe starting in uh late 2015 2016 that's when i started uh getting the the death notice books so I did. I translated the first one, and I also translated the the second one. Right. And then I did have the opportunity to take on the third, but that was around that same time. I had just moved back to the U.S. That was in uh, like the end of 2018, and at that point, I realized that uh, I didn't. In, at least in my opinion, I didn't really have a skill that lent itself to uh, to a full time job, uh, or at least the kinds of jobs that were available in the U.S. Um, because I had I'd been focusing a lot on uh, Chinese just as a um, really like a, a part time or like a freelance job. Uh, my translation yeah. work. But as far as full time work went, I had been switching from I was teaching English. I worked as a uh, a study abroad counselor. Um, I worked as a technical writer for a bit, and then uh, my last job before moving back, I was a uh, video producer and editor at a startup. Uh, so a lot of like jumping back and forth, and that was when I made the decision to jump into uh, into software engineering. Um, so that is really, I guess you could say, like my most recent venture. Yeah, it's it's definitely been an interesting ride over. Mm. Uh, I guess the last like. 10 plus years yeah it, it definitely sounds like um like you've had the kind of full gamut of experiences in although it's 10 years that's a lot of stuff crammed into 10 years it's, it's funny that you were um just outside Hangzhou being an English teacher that's um well so so to speak just outside near-ish Hangzhou because my uh, I had my first year in China was uh also like post post-graduation off I go with some vaguely defined uh goals and I ended up um in in Zhejiang province um, 
is Jiaxing in Zhejiang or is it in yeah, Jiaxing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jiaxing is in Zhejiang province. And I, I also did live in uh, Hangzhou for two years too. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So that, that was, I <laughs> kind of ironically, I mean, now that I'm back here, I, I do end up reminiscing a lot about my, uh, uh, yeah. my time in China, especially, well, now with, uh, you know, the country basically locked down. <laughs> Yeah, it's getting easier and easier to kind of have like an alternate life in your, for me anyway, in like my memories and my daydreams. Yeah. It's it's fun to some extent, but I, I try not to indulge myself too much. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, Hangzhou was, uh, I was in Dexing County near Moganshan. Did you ever hear about or go to Moganshan? Yeah, I actually uh, did. Yeah, I did get to uh, visit it once. Yeah, I was near there. Hangzhou was like uh, where I'd go most weekends. I can imagine living there for two years could be pretty nice yeah it was nice. i was basically a five to ten minute bike ride uh away from the west lake wow so i was it was yeah definitely uh i i there were a couple of mornings you know where i would just um just get on a like a, a, a mo bike and just ride around the lake uh mm. and yeah yeah like like i said i i do wish that was what i could do now but uh it's really nice to have had that experience yeah i've well, I've I've had a, a year intervening in Edinburgh, but if if you um kind of jump over that, my my new life and my old life is hilarious. I used to be in uh, Shanghai, one of the biggest cities in the world, mm-hmm. and now I'm in uh, Fife, the Fife countryside of, of Scotland, in a little cabin just opposite a stable. So mm-hmm. it, almost as as big a contrast as you yeah. could um imagine. <laughs> but um we've I've already said it's best not to get too bogged down in in our own reminiscences so let's charge on and look at uh, our our book for this episode Death Notice so this is a chinese crime novel by Zhou Haohui and since it's a crime novel i'm going to pursue three lines of investigation as i interrogate you uh one's china one is crime fiction and one's Zhou Haohui mm-hmm. um so my first question about china was going to be how did you learn Chinese? I, you've already talked about that. Um, is there anything else of interest to say about how how it was for you learning the language, or should we should we skip um, over that one? Yeah, I I could go into a little bit more detail um, in case any listeners are just curious or uh, learning Chinese themselves. Perfect. Uh, I guess to kind of summarize my like specifically my journey of learning Chinese. Uh, well, like I said, for uh, in uh, in college, I studied Chinese. That was my major. So my first exposure to Chinese was my my first semester of college. Uh, and um, initially, I was uh, I don't know if I should say that I was not very good at it, but I did have to have some extra tutoring uh, my, around my first year. But what made it really click for me was um, after my, uh, my, my second year um, in college, I did a, I guess it was a five to six month stint in, uh, in Beijing. So that was basically over the, uh, that was my summer and the, uh, the fall semester I was studying in Beijing. So um, my first time in China, uh, living there for an extended period of time, and I was completely immersed in the language. We had to uh, sign a language pledge where we promised to speak exclusively uh, Chinese during the program, unless we were, you know, unless I was like calling family, because uh, I guess otherwise I'd have to like, you know, like scribble notes on, on signs or something. <laughs> um, but that experience, uh, I, I think, really completely changed my uh, my my own attitude towards learning chinese i and and i think what was really the turning point was just seeing firsthand or experiencing um the uh, yeah i mean what really transformed my attitude towards learning chinese was just being able to use the language every day and you know see it in use whether it was uh you know reading writing speaking it um mm. And uh, I had the opportunity to make plenty of mistakes, have a lot of, uh, you know, awkward misunderstandings. One that still stands out in my memory was uh, we were assigned a, uh, a, a quote unquote host family there. So we weren't living with them, but um, we did visit them uh, a few times during uh, each semester. Um, yeah. So I, uh, when I visited mine, uh, and so, you know, we were speaking in, in Chinese and so there was one misunderstanding where uh, we walked into uh, a room in their house and 
I, I think they, they might have had the, the air conditioning on because it was summer and um, my, uh, my host mother <laughs> said, uh, so it's like, you know, it's cool in here. But because this was a, a word that I actually, you know, wasn't familiar with, I, I knew like, you know, uh, liang meant like cool or cold. But when she said liang kuai, I, I thought she meant like liang kuai, like I have to pay, you know, like two kuai to <laughs> Remy B. So, and I was thinking, what is it like, you know, for the, like the food that she got? And oh, no. <laughs> I, I started like, I started reaching uh, for my wallet, but I, fortunately I was, um, I was visiting with another student who was, um, you know, a little bit more advanced uh, in, in her Chinese, or at least, uh, you know, understood that uh, you, you didn't need to spend money here. So I started reaching for my wallet, but then I saw that the other student with me was just like, you know, wasn't doing that at all. So before like either of them could see it, I just slowly put my wallet back. Um, <laughs> so living in China after, uh, after like completing my major was super helpful for improving my Chinese because it really is just um, making, making those mistakes, uh, I, I think is what, really helped uh, improve my Chinese. Uh, and alongside that, when I was actually living uh, in China after college, I, I spent a lot of time, probably too much time, just like in my uh, apartment on campus, just reading books in Chinese. Um, I, uh, I I really liked reading um, several books by uh, Yu Hua, who um, a lot mm. of people might know as the author of uh, To Live, which was adapted into a uh, film directed by Zhang Yimou. Um, I, the two books that I read by him were, uh, I think the first one I read was um, Chronicles of a Blood Merchant. Um, and I also read Brothers. I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the order that I read them in, but those were, uh, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed both of those a lot. And I took them very slowly, just uh, consulting with a dictionary. Uh, or I guess by dictionary, um, I mean uh, Pleco. Um, my phone, which is probably the most useful app I've ever downloaded. Uh, it's been in, it's been in, installed in my phone since, uh, I guess, basically since like I, I first visited China. Um, right. So I've, I, I was consulting that uh, as I was reading. So uh, I, I think I also took notes on some words that I was unfamiliar with. I, I know a lot of people recommend that if you are reading or say like, you know, watching a uh, TV show or movie uh, in another language, or at least I heard this um, from other people who are speaking Chinese, their recommendation was to not pause it, just to keep going and um, really try to just grasp like the gist of, of what was being said. Um, but maybe it was just the, the way that I, that I prefer to learn. I would watch uh, movies and TV shows extremely slowly. I would pause every time there was a word that I didn't know and and look it up, just because I it would bother me if I uh, if I didn't understand mm. everything that was being said. I, I don't want to recommend my approach, saying that you know this is the the way that you should learn, but I guess to present both because uh, I can definitely see the value in uh, really, especially if you're watching a TV show or a movie. Uh, I think it might actually be better to just let it kind of wash over you because that would prepare you for uh, real life situations a little bit better. But um, I've, I've had a lot of uh, practice with um, just spoken and like conversational Chinese just through, uh, through my wife who is from uh, Northeastern China. Um, right. So yeah, e even here in the U S we're speaking in Chinese every day. So it's still uh, that that's mainly how I uh, get to, uh, continue practicing my Chinese, keep it from getting too rusty. Are you speaking it with a Dongbei accent? Um, not, not extremely. Um, she, my, my wife has a, uh, her, her accent gets a lot stronger when she's, uh, speaking to family. So I, I've, right. you know, I've like visited her family for, um, uh, for the Chinese New Year, um, several, several times. Uh, so yeah, I have, and that was definitely a, uh, an interesting crash course in, uh, in Dongbeihua <laughs> and yeah, Northeastern Chinese. Nice. Um, it's nice that you mentioned Yu Hua. He's, um, someone I've really should have done on this podcast already. I've been, uh, recommended and asked to do him a few times, but yeah, it's, it's a, a good reminder. I've mm -hmm. still not actually read nothing by him, um, in translation, 
But speaking of reading things, let's move on to the next question. So yeah. crime fiction, um, outside of translation, as genre is absolutely huge. It's um, it's the best selling of any book genre uh, in, in the UK. And I think for a lot of the rest of the English speaking world, it's um, second after uh, romance coming very close behind it. So it, it's massive. This is a huge genre. So it's really interesting to see books that are translated from Chinese set in China, which are in this uh, genre in like a really recognizable form. It's not I think in this case, in this book, it's really not very different from other crime and detective books you'd get um, from writers writing in English. Um, so I, I myself, I don't think, I can't think of any um, crime fiction I've read in English, actually. Maybe some detective stories, mm -hmm. but like any really classic um, examples of the genre that I've read are probably stuff I've read because it's translated from Chinese. Um, slightly strange to um, actually stop and think about that. But yeah, my, my question for you is, is twofold. Um, one is, do you read much crime fiction yourself? And uh, second part of that question is, do you have any thoughts about um, the crime fiction in China, what it means for a crime novel to be a, a Chinese crime novel? Sure. Um, so yeah, I guess kind of similar to you, I do not read a lot of crime fiction in general. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I was, I was just trying to think of some of the books that I've read that could be considered crime fiction. I know that back in high school, I was a, um, a big fan of the, the Jack Reacher novels. Um, right. They're like in the thriller sort of crossover bridge between those two genres. Yeah, yeah. So definitely a lot of similarities. Uh, and I know when I was younger, I was a big fan of the Hardy Boys novels. So maybe a little more, yeah, more like detective novels. But mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I don't think I've read too much uh, straight up crime fiction. I, I usually tend to, uh, well, I, although I guess I did read The Silence of the Lambs in high school. So I guess that counts. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I usually tend to gravitate towards uh, like fantasy and sci-fi. And actually, so uh, as for your second question about um, uh, Chinese crime fiction, um, as far as like what I've read in, in Chinese, I, I also have, uh, you know, just like in, in English, I prefer to read like fantasy and sci-fi and it's the same uh, if if I'm choosing something to read in Chinese, I'll usually uh, pick like you know genre fiction. Um, mm. And actually, when I when I first moved to China, I uh, uh, went to a one of the local bookstores, and uh, I went to the sci-fi section and at random uh, picked a book, and it was a collection of short stories, and I liked it because. I thought the cover looked cool and I was like thumbing through the first story and I thought it was good. Uh, so I brought it back and uh, it was, it was actually by uh, Liu Cixin who Sweet. I, I knew nothing about him at the time. Uh, let's see, I guess uh, I think the three body, uh, the first book in the three body series in China, I think came out in around like 2008. So yeah. that was already out by that time, but I wasn't familiar with it. Um, but then, you know, when he kind of blew up internationally, um, that was, uh, I actually, I think by that point, I had already read the, uh, the first three body book, um, but uh, the, the Chinese version of that. Mm. And let's see, I was also not expecting when I initially picked up that collection of short stories that I would end up translating like another one of his short stories uh, a few years later. Uh, one called With Her Eyes was published in a, a collection called The Wandering Earth, which is... Oh, right. Yeah, yeah I've read that. Yeah, one of his other uh, short stories. Uh, that's, maybe, uh, maybe that's where, when I was picking up my copy of uh, Death Notice, I was like, Zach Calusa, I've seen that somewhere before. Because um, The Wandering Earth is... Um, the translator credits are several different translators. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you look in the uh, copyrights page, um, the really famous name there is Ken Leo, but right. I guess in that line with him, there's Zach Halusa. Right, right. So, cool. and uh, I, I noticed that you've, uh, well, that you also had the chance to uh, speak to Ken Leo on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is, um, it's the Translated Chinese Fiction Podcast, but I think some listeners who found it via, um, via all the Chinese sci-fi episodes I've done have been surprised to realize that the word science isn't sitting um, before the word fiction in the podcast name, because mm -hmm. I talk about it so much on the show. And yeah, if, if you, 
place authors above um, translators, then the biggest stars from Chinese sci-fi I've had on would be uh, Xia Jia and Chen Chiu Fan. But yeah, Ken, Ken Leo did come on to talk about Ha Jun Fang's novel. And mm-hmm. that, was, that was really surreal, <laughs> talking to him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I can imagine. It's, um, and I guess a, a fun fact. So the, uh, uh, the, the company that, uh, basically the company that I got the, the death notice gig through, uh, so uh, a Beijing-based uh, company called Sepiek. Um, I, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, the, the acronym is C-E-P-I-E-C. Uh, but mm. they, uh, what they do is um, managing the, uh, the uh, foreign language translation rights of Chinese novels. Um, the uh you know the big like the book that they had handled before death notice uh was like the well i guess books was the uh three body trilogy right Uh, so yeah uh so they yeah and they they told me some stories about when uh they they had the chance to uh to meet ken leo uh so that was definitely fun to hear about one last note on like the topic of uh more like genre oriented fiction uh i'm not sure if are, are you familiar with the um kind of been translated into English as uh, the Grave Robber Chronicles? No, although um, I did have an episode with uh, like a web fiction translator uh, Mm -hmm. who goes by her username, Et Valer. She had translated a web novel, which was in this Chinese genre of like grave robbing or tomb raiding. Mm -hmm. So I know a little bit about the genre as a whole, but I I don't, if I have heard of this series, then I've I need my memory refreshed, I think. Okay, yeah, it's, I was just uh, kind of curious because I don't, and uh, I don't think there's really been like a, uh, I, I, I wanna, I'm trying to think of how to uh, phrase this without uh, possibly, you know, offending a fellow translator, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's been a, I guess you could say a, like a fully faithful uh, translation made of, uh, of the series um, right. in English, but uh, it's something that I, uh, I, I read in Chinese and, and had a lot of fun with, uh, and I've, I've actually kind of been um, as an effort to really get back into um, reading Chinese. Uh, I am kind of like starting from the beginning again, but uh, that, that's an example of, I think, a uh, really, I guess you could say like, you know, ex- exciting kind of like thriller. Um, it, it, it's really like a, a fast moving series of stories that is basically like, um, I guess you could picture it as Indiana Jones, but set in modern day China. So that's yeah. an example of a like, you know, genre fiction where the the Chinese setting and character really um, plays like an important role in the story. Right. That was really interesting, like for me as a reader, uh, who you know obviously did not like grow up in this culture. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've, I've noticed um, there's at, l- at least one, um, maybe two books in Amazon Crossing's uh, list of books translated from Chinese that are kind of dabbling in that genre. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something I could say. It was probably going to come up at some point, but about like speaking about genre fiction as a whole. So. Listeners who've been listening since uh, forever are probably tired of hearing about this by now. But um, last year, I got invited to this um, conference, not a seminar, not a conference, a symposium, that's the word, a symposium on uh, Chinese genre fiction uh, in Leeds. And they were really just looking at two genres. One was uh, sci-fi and the other was crime. Mm. And uh, I remember I mentioned to you when we got talking, I'd met two of the people from Head of Zeus, who stupidly mm-hmm. I thought were your publishers. Um, I did my research since, and I've learned this book that I'm holding, the Head of Zeus edition, is a UK edition. The original, like the translation and the initial publication was uh, done by Doubleday over mm-hmm. in the States. Um, but I think it's still worth mentioning Head of Zeus because um, outside of uh, America, I believe, they they probably made an awful lot of money because they handled a uh, publication of three, uh, the free body problem in the right. UK. And I think the Commonwealth and since then they've put out um, more Chinese sci-fi in, 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 in English in the Commonwealth, but they were there at the symposium to kind of talk about how they were now trying to do the same for crime, Chinese crime fiction. Um, so they're trying to make like a list of all these different books. And I'd imagine that's why they bought the, commonwealth i think rights for death notice Mm -hmm. um and i have read when we're talking about like what chinese crime uh we've read i have read one of the other books uh, that they've done or bought rights for and it was um second sister Mm -hmm. by chen hokei but 
that was kind of you know different but the same compared with death notice because he's a hong kong writer and that story set in hong kong mm. whereas this one's from the mainland although it does have some sort of a link with hong kong that we might get into later in its um tv adapt adaptation mm. but yeah um i should probably keep the the ball rolling here um let's go into the third line of investigation it's joe hao hui the author himself can you tell the listeners much about um, Joe and like what he does? Sure. Um, so kind of like a general summary of uh, Joe Haohui. Uh, I mean, he's a uh, successful writer. He's really carved out a space for himself uh, in the, I guess you could say the, you know, suspense, thriller, crime genre in, uh, in China. And um, I, I was actually uh, doing a bit of um, research recently on him, and I, I had seen that. So, you know, he has branched out from prose to screenwriting. So he, um, it looks like he co-wrote the, uh, the screenplay for, for the uh, Death Notice TV series. Uh, and also in 2018, he directed a film uh, that he also wrote the script for. Um, and just as I guess a bit of trivia, the uh, the title for that movie it's a it's a pun on the Chinese translation of uh, Arabian Nights. What, so what's the pun? The uh, the Chinese translation of Arabian Nights is Tian Fang Ye Tan, and the Chinese title of this is Tian Fang Yi Tan. So the last All two right. characters are, uh, are are different, um, kind of like I guess you could say like strange conversations. Uh, because it's a, um, I, I haven't seen it, but uh, from what I understand about it, it's a, it's a movie where there are uh, several several different characters, each with their own story, uh, kind of, and some of them are like border on the fantastical. Cool. I oh, I guess one uh, an- another thing about Joe Haohui. So I, uh, I I haven't really had the chance to speak with him one on one, but I uh, I did get to interact with him. Uh, when we were doing uh, a couple of press interviews for Death Notice, uh, which was basically um, just some, uh, it was me, uh, Joe Haohui, and uh, Chun Feng, who is the person who, uh, at, at Sepiak, who um, I was in contact with, like, throughout, you know, the translation of the entire book. And he was really helpful in, you know, setting a lot of these things up. Um, but we were on the, on the phone, um, or I think we actually used uh, used WeChat just to have like a, a group voice call. Um, right. And we were talking to, uh, there was one call with someone from uh, the New York Times, another call with someone from the Wall Street Journal. And uh, that was uh, really, I guess, my first time doing like live interpreting. Um, so I was basically Joe Hahui's interpreter uh, for each call, which was an interesting experience, maybe a little nerve wracking. Yeah, I can imagine. I was probably going to mention this at some point. So my um, quote unquote research for this episode consisted mostly of reading and rereading um, one New York Times article, which gave me some some info about um, a more holistic picture of, of the book and its uh, TV and film adaptations and, and Joe himself. So I'll, I'll put a link for that in the show notes for listeners if you guys want to read it. Oh yeah, so I, I do have one more question. When you were working through your translation did you have much correspondence with joe did you need to query him about anything or did he want to correct anything so from from what i remember uh when i was doing the translation there were there were a few points where i um i I did have some questions about the translation so um i would make notes about it um but mostly um a lot of the the questions I, i really asked uh Chan Feng, who I mentioned uh, uh, just a little bit earlier, and uh, Joe Haohui was he was fairly hands off uh, throughout the process. From what I remember, he was um, uh, I guess really wanted me to kind of uh, I guess like take the reins at um, mm. uh, for the most part mm-hmm. and uh, like translate it as I saw fit. And yeah, uh, we can we can probably go into this a little bit later, but then you know after my my initial translation was was fairly faithful to uh, to the original, but um, there were some changes that were were made a little bit later. Um, although uh, I guess one thing that was changed during the initial translation, um, which might be uh, 
might be a bit surprising for uh, people who have read the novel is that the uh, so the the setting uh, for the novel um, was initially not Chengdu. Uh, it was a fairly like anonymous uh, city called uh, I guess you could translate it as like City A, or in in Chinese it was always like A Shi. Um, right. So uh, when I started translating this. Uh, there was like um, like one note that I got was uh, that we should set it in an actual place because um, in the uh, in I mean in the original um, Pei Tao who uh, was also uh, called Luo Fei Pei Tao is not his original name in the uh, the Chinese novel um, but the hmm. the name was the name was actually changed uh, after I did my initial translation. And the reason for that was it was just because of legal issues. Because I think uh, Joe Halway had, uh, prior to Death Notice, written uh, at least like one other book. I think uh, I think the Chinese title for that I know one of them was I think uh, Xionghua. I'm not sure what it is in English, but uh, Luo Fei had been um, already uh, like appeared as a character in an English translation of another one of his books. So there was some right. kind of type of legal or copyright issue. I was suddenly informed of as I started editing it. <laughs> uh, so I basically just did a like a select all and replace. Uh, so yep. every law of a became pay tau. Every law, all I had to check and you know, just change it to pay. But I, w- I was initially talking about the uh, the difference in setting. Um, so initially in the, the original Chinese book, even though it was set in this city A, uh, the main character was uh, still from uh, Longzhou, and the one of the reasons why um, it was suggested that I like choose an actual city is because, well, if uh, you know if the main character is from like an actual city, um, and I, I think there are several Longzhou's in China, but I know the I guess yeah. the most famous one would be in uh, Guangxi Province. Mm-hmm. Um, but so it was suggested uh, that I use an actual city and. Uh, Chengdu um, was, as far as I remember, it was actually suggested to me. I changed the setting to uh, Chengdu, and a lot of the, uh, I guess what you call the local flavor, a lot of that came out during the editing process and not during the initial translation. Right. Yeah. Um, I remember you you had told me when we first got talking that there had been some interesting um, changes advised uh, from the editorial level and I was kind of wondering oh I wonder what those are that'll be interesting to find out and then I read the New York Times article and it said Joe's from he's from Yangzhou in Jiangsu province he's even written a book on Huayang cuisine the cuisine of like Jiangsu and that region and he was initially kind of conceiving of the city I guess I've now learned Asia uh, being like either Yangzhou or, or Nanjing or somewhere in, in Jiangsu, sort of that sort of region. And then the, the New York Times article said, but yes, yeah, so then it was switched to Chengdu. And I was like, huh, what? Mm-hmm. Because, but then I wasn't, as I was, I thought back on what I'd read, I thought, mm, yeah, I can, I can kind of see that because the main reason I knew it was set in Chengdu was because like it, it said so. I, I remember yeah. there was a reference to a bowl of spicy uh, dandan noodles, I think. Mm-hmm. And then otherwise, it really could have been anywhere. It's not, it's not um, the 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 Chengdu or Sichuan flavor isn't. Uh, it's not oozing out the pages, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The uh, so um, may, maybe to jump ahead a little bit, but it is uh, yeah, it's pretty relevant. Um, when uh, I was like I said before, kind of adding this uh, local flavor, it was uh, really after I um, after that initial manuscript had been uh, like, you know, picked up by Doubleday, uh, the, um, the editing team, or, well, it was mainly the, uh, like the, the head editor who was working with me, uh, a guy named Robert Bloom. Uh, he had a lot of really helpful suggestions uh, for, um, for editing and at some points uh, rewriting, you know, parts of uh, the book. And, uh, one of his main points was to make the uh, the setting much like, closer to uh, a character in in many ways. Um, so I, uh, you know, as I went through um, and was making edits and slight rewrites, I took the chance to um, really add that, you know, add more details about the setting 
um, and try to think about it like what are some what are some things that might stand out to uh, to a reader or you know things that like I see basically thinking about what I saw in my head um, in, mm. in certain scenes and thinking well what about this scene uh, what would be helpful if I you know kind of explained or just you know added this detail to help the like an English speaking reader paint the same picture in their head. Uh, so the Chengdu in the novel became kind of an amalgamation of the uh, really the different cities in China that, that I had lived in. Right. So, I, I mean, I had mainly spent time in uh, like, you know, initially studying in Beijing, um, but then a lot of time in uh, Zhejiang province. Uh, although I had spent, like, like I said before, I uh, was in Chengdu for three weeks as part of a study abroad program. So um, yeah, when I when I referenced the, uh, uh, I mentioned the Dan Dan Mian in the book, mm. uh, that is, well, yeah, my, my first experience with uh, like the authentic Sichuanese food was uh, with a, a bowl of Dan Dan noodles uh, in Chengdu, where it was really my first time having, because, you know, Chinese cuisine, you have like two, well, I guess you could say you have two main types of like spiciness uh, to, to really generalize. Um, you have, well, I guess the, the, the general type of spicy sensation that most people are familiar with. And then you also have like the numbing spiciness. Uh, mm. And uh, that was my first time having experiencing that numbing spiciness. Uh, I, I started, you know, eating eating the noodles a, a few bites in. Uh, my tongue, my mouth started to feel a little bit strange, and <laughs> I, I, I got a little bit scared. I because I didn't know that this was supposed to happen. Uh, it's I, like, so oh no! <laughs> I, I, was, I was, yeah, yeah. I, I was eating by myself. So I was thinking, am I allergic to this? Is is there something <laughs> wrong with my mouth right now? Uh, and I, I started like my eyes started watering, my <laughs> nose started running, uh, and then I realized, okay, I think I'm surviving this. I think it might be something with the food. Mm. I probably just really like, you know, bit down on a big peppercorn. Uh, yep. Um, I, I, I did incorporate some uh, some elements of like my memory of Chengdu. Um, I think I, after doing a lot of intensive research on Baidu. Um, I did incorporate a bit of uh, like Sichuanese, um, I think for the name of one area, which um, if my memory of several years ago, certainly, well, I think the translation or the, it was the name of a place that was called something like the Roach Nest or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, maybe um, I guess apologies to uh, any listeners who are, uh, from Chengdu or who are living in Chengdu right now, if my portrayal, you know, wasn't completely faithful. But um, yeah, I, I try to, to the best of my ability, you know, represent a like a, a modern Chinese city. Cool. Um, what you meant, sorry, what you mentioned earlier about the um, city being called like a city or city A is interesting that it that, um, that's the case because. The other, um, so I've done like two other crime novels on this podcast. One was um, The Perfect Crime by IE, which is really more like a, not really genre fiction, more of a, like a dark existential sort of thing that uses a crime as the, to drive the plot. But then the other one I did was much more like a, like a crime, gen- generic sounds mean, but like a slots right into the genre crime novel. And that was uh, The Untouched Crime. Um, and I had the, the translator on for that one too, Michelle Dieter. And she was telling me there was a difference between the English and the original language versions. In the English language version, it's set in Hangzhou, um, mm-hmm. funnily enough. And it's you know, it's not too important that the setting is Hangzhou. We just know that um, most of the story is happening in the university area on the north side of West Lake. Mm-hmm. It's not too, too relevant, but at least it places the story on the map somewhere. But in the Chinese version, um, it's just called... H city and you kind of have to read between the lines to the references to the lake and stuff to know it's set in Hangzhou and I think she said the reason for, for in that case is that China where so many things are sensitive if, if the story is about crime and official corruption and whatnot um, you it's it's better or publishers prefer not to name any real places so that it doesn't seem they're pointing the finger at anyone 
So I wonder if that's a convention in, in publishing crime fiction in China. I really, I really don't know, but it would make sense to me. Yeah, I, I actually uh, wasn't really aware that this was kind of, you know, a thing or like happened uh, more than once. But yeah, I mean, that, that, that reason does, does actually make sense. And probably, yeah, I mean, that is fairly likely that's the reason why it was originally, uh, the setting was originally uh, a city or city A. Um, maybe, maybe this is just like my own imagination, but also, you know, the possibility that, you know, this could be any city. Yeah, kind of reminds me, I think I said this in the Untouched Crime episode as well, but it kind of reminds me when you're reading like a, a novel from the Victorian times or thereabouts, and a place or a character will just be named as underscore. As I was talking, or, or they'll be initialed, I was talking to my good friend, Jay, and it's like, oh, why, why, why are they doing this? But it was just a, a convention at the time that's uh, since kind of receded. Mm. Um, but yeah, we've that. That's the end of our chat about Zhou Hao Hui. That certainly went in some um, interesting tangents. Mm. But let's get on to talking about the the book itself, Death Notice. So um, first things first. Um, let's give the readers a sense of the story. I have my copy of the book in front of me, and it's got a blurb. And there's something pretty interesting about the blurb that a reader would notice once they're just a few chapters into the book so what i'm going to do i'm just going to read the blurb and then maybe we can um break it down or yeah we'll sure. break it down i guess so here we go for nearly two decades an unsolved murder case has haunted sergeant Zheng haoming of the chengdu police department 18 years ago two victims were murdered after being served with death notices. In refined calligraphy, their perceived crimes were itemized and they were sentenced to death. The date of execution was declared, as was the name of their executioner, Eumenides. Now, a user on an internet forum has asked the public to submit names for judgment, judgment for those the law cannot touch. Those found guilty will be punished and there is only one sentence, death. The user's handle, Eumenides. Does Jung have a lead? Has a long dormant serial killer resurfaced? Perhaps modern police techniques, criminal pro profiling, online surveillance, and SWAT quick response teams can catch a killer who has previously evaded justice. Or perhaps the killer is more than a match for whatever the Chengdu Police Department can muster. The first in a trilogy and a bestseller in China, Death Notice is a high-octane, high-concept cat-and-mouse thriller that adds an exhilarating new gear to the police procedural. So... Pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive blurb. Um, the first thing I noticed, not meaning to spoil anything for anyone who's not read the book, Zhang Haoming is not our guy for, for most of the book. He gets bumped off pretty near the start. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shall we, shall we, do you think the blurb misses anything really key that the listener should know about the plot? Or do you think that summarizes everything nicely? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think the, I mean, the main focus of the book, um, at least in my opinion, is uh, really just, you know, tracking, uh, trying to track this, this killer, this uh, Eumenides, who's, you know, and his uh, brand of, I guess you could call it like crowdsourced justice. Mm -hmm. You could definitely focus on, uh, you know, different characters, maybe a bit more on, on Pei Tao, but um, I think for drawing someone in, um, yeah, I think that sounds like a, a good angle to me, like focusing on the, you know, this is a, uh, something with a bit of history behind it and that they're trying to crack the case today. Well, one thing um, that the blurb doesn't tell is, that I didn't realize until fairly far through, is that it's not, the, the, the Chinese edition is from a few years back, um, it says here in the copyright, something like 2015 is when the Chinese book is from, or oh, 14, 2014. And it made it into English 2018. But the setting of the book is like 2002 or three or four ish. Is that right? Uh, yeah. And actually, I believe um, I, I would have to uh, go back to Baidu for this. But um, I think that uh, Death Notice was originally, uh, originally published earlier. Um, I don't want to be spreading false information, but I think it was like initially published online. Right. Yeah. I think, um, so I did a, a bonus episode on, on Patreon um, prior to this one, just kind of warming myself up in a way. And I think I checked this. It occurred to me that the online publication wouldn't be the same as the print one. Mm -hmm. And I think if I remember right, the online publication was just a year or two before the print. I don't think there was a huge gap. Hmm. So my, my thinking was that um, he'd maybe put the setting that far back in time to avoid the problem of like smartphones and wireless internet mm -hmm. and, 
and stuff. I'm actually, yeah, not too sure about why the setting was moved back, but uh, I mean, just in, in general, and I mean, as someone who, uh, you know, occasionally enjoys writing, I think something that is nice about, you know, choosing a certain period in time, uh, as opposed to always making it the present is that you do, yeah, you are kind of like fully aware of um, the constraints of the time. And I guess there's less chance of it seeming outdated if you choose something that is, you know, del- mm-hmm. deliberately set in the past. Um, but yeah, I sh- uh, just to go slightly off on a tangent, but what you were mentioning about the, uh, when the, the print edition was, uh, was published. Um, yeah, I uh, actually back in 2015, that was when I was initially uh, contacted about translating this. Um, right. But uh, so I initially, you know, received a, um, I guess a it was like a uh, like a word doc version of the novel but then I was told to hold off on it for uh, I guess it was like about half a year or so um, because they were they were making edits uh, right like edits to the, the Chinese version so I guess this was um, as the print version was getting ready to go out and uh, mm. then once that was ready that was when I could go ahead with my translation Wow, so they're really, um, really on the ball with getting this one out into mm-hmm. multiple languages as fast as they could. That's, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, so that's that's our story. Oh yeah, no, there was one other question um, that was on my mind. So the the name of the killer, Eumenides, um, the the book goes out of its way to stress that the online messages, the the name, the username Eumenides has been spelled out in um, the Latin alphabet. So it's not like a Chinese um, transliteration or anything. Is was is this an like a an adaptation for the English uh, version, or is this was it is this exactly the same in the Chinese too? Uh, yeah, it's really the only um, the only like non Chinese word that appears in the book. Um, it, and actually, yeah, you, you did remind me that I and as I was translating the book, I was pronouncing the name Eumenides uh, incorrectly in my head the entire time. Uh, I. I always assumed it was uh, Eumenides. Uh, right. Yeah, that's that's one of the fun things about reading books. I've just been reading um, some short stories by Ted Chiang, and there's a story where uh, it's about like online kind of AI pet sort of things, and they're called Digiants. But my brain was obviously forgetting flashbacks to when I watched Digimon as a kid. I was calling them Digidents mm. in my head. Thankfully, no one was there to hear me mis- uh, mispronounce it. But then... Uh, about halfway through, I was like, "Oh no, oh no, I'm, <laughs> I've been, I've been calling them Digimon. They're actually Digiants." Um, and I, or uh, in an earlier episode of the show, this came up, and I had told the story of how my dad used to read Harry Potter to me, and Hermione in my to, in my world was Herimony for years and years until my granny caught me saying it and laughed well, at I, me. I think I in in my head it was uh, I forget if it was like. Hermione or Hermione, like until I actually uh, saw the first movie. I'm sure lots of uh, adults who've been reading the book had a bit of like an oh shit moment when they were sitting in the cinema watching that one. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, um, right. So my next question here, uh, I think we've both established we're not masterful readers of, uh, or not highly uh, veteran, we're not veteran readers of of crime, but I have a feeling that there's kind of a spectrum in crime fiction and it's kind of like one end of the spectrum, you have fun, light reads. Mm-hmm. And then at the other end, you've got relentlessly dark stuff. Um, so like the TV series True Detective, that's on the relentlessly dark. It gets so dark that we go into like philosophical pessimism. And maybe like the lighter end of the spectrum would be someone investigating a stolen teacup or something. Mm-hmm. But there's also like the page turner, or is it not, not necessarily how much of a page turner something is, but also how literary something is and i suppose you could have a light crime novel which is um quite literary and trying to be deep but i feel like the literariness tends towards or the philosophical heaviness would probably tend towards the darker stuff um and my feeling about this book was it it struck a fairly good balance it didn't feel like fluff um but it wasn't mentally taxing me and it kept me turning the pages and it seemed like it was very competently written the thing that was was making me think was it's a pretty dark topic and the murders that happen are quite gruesome but i felt like it could have potentially been written several shades darker but this is really subjective so i guess my question is like how dark on the spectrum of like 
a light read to a dark and heavy read. Where do you think this this book sits? Uh, well, yeah, I guess, I mean, first, I, I definitely agree uh, with what you're saying about the, the balance that it strikes. Um, and my, my feeling, uh, just you know, what I was thinking as I was translating the book and looking back on the edits is that there's definitely an emphasis on this uh, constant momentum of the plot. Mm. Um, and I think just by, by that nature, um, yeah, making it lean more towards being a, a page turner, um, you possibly like linger, linger a little bit less on the, uh, the darker elements of, uh, of the book and the plot, um, which, you know, could prevent it from, uh, feeling a little bit too much like you're, you know, drudging, uh, through, through all this, uh, gloominess mm -hmm. in the book, but, um, Actually, I think that um, maybe not the book as a whole, but certain parts of the book are uh, a little bit darker than the original. Um, mainly, one thing that, that stands out to me is um, when you have that uh, one scene in, uh, like in the, the mine tunnels um, where uh, the characters find these, uh, like the bodies hanging from the, uh, like the tunnel ceiling yeah uh, that that was not in the original um and oh. the way that that came about was um it was initially uh suggested by uh, like robert the head editor at, at doubleday who um his specific feedback was that um because like previously the uh the police had seen a uh like a recording of uh what was it i guess 12 12 people being killed in a setting that looked uh, fairly similar to the mine tunnels. So his suggestion was, what if like, you actually find the bodies? What if the, uh, the police find the bodies once they're actually in the tunnels? Um, right. So I, I took that and I think his initial suggestion was like a pile of the bodies. Um, but then I, uh, I thought, okay, well, what would, what would be a way to make it a little bit more, uh, a little bit darker? Uh, so I just- Or more, more striking them, cinematic yeah. image way too a little bit more morbid uh and i i just thought of well they could be hanging from the ceiling <laughs> that's a pretty good creative choice um it, like if, if it was a pile of bodies i'd be like oh okay uh, mm -hmm. right they're dead whereas hanging from the hanging from the roof that i'd be as a reader i was more like <gasps> oh, no, oh no this guy like, really yeah. is evil like like it's a little bit more like presentational where you know it's like meant mm -hmm. to be discovered by someone right yeah it's more um um, a deliberate choice by the the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's interesting that um, you uh, the the the, edit, the editor and used the translator made so many changes. Was there any pushback against any of that from the Chinese side, or is um, that all is that all top secret? No, I mean they they were like they were fine with the translation. It was um, in the the kind of like free reign that I that I mentioned earlier. That really mainly came into play uh, once we were doing the the edits of the book. Um, right. And um, yeah, I mean, as far as I remember, uh, the like the the Chinese uh, like client or like Sepiak, uh, Zhou Haohui, they were all like very open to to all the changes. Basically, just to make it um, as good as it could be, or you know, as like exciting as it could be uh, yeah. for an English speaking audience. That's interesting. I have had um, similar but not the same stories where um, editorial decisions on the English language side have like informed either the Chinese author has um, feel, felt like they've gotten some good feedback or it's even something that's incorporated into later Chinese editions. Um, so f I don't know, I'll, I don't know if this would bore the listeners because it's been mentioned before, but I'll give two really quick examples from Chinese sci-fi. Um, Chen Xiufan's Waste Tide, he got quite a lot of feedback from the uh, editor at Tor about some of the descriptions of the like the female characters and how they were they were treated and I don't I so those were implemented in the English edition I don't know if they've been implemented back on the Chinese side but um, Chen Xiufan himself said he, he kind of felt grateful for the feedback it was something he hadn't considered before and he'll try and incorporate it back into his own writing but like another example I think I, I could be wrong here. I'm pretty sure this is right. But um, do you know about the chapter order change that happened in the Three Body uh, series? Uh, no, actually, I haven't heard about that. Yeah. Um, so, 
But if you if you pick up the English uh, edition of Three Body Problem, the first chapter, we start off in the, the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. And in the original Chinese edition, that's a flashback that happens about halfway through the book. And when uh, Ken, Ken Leo, I think, himself suggested putting it to the front, he thought it was a better opener. And when he ran that idea by Liu Cixin, uh, the author, Liu Cixin said, oh, how did you know that was initially how the book was supposed to be? I, I only um, moved it into the middle so that the censors wouldn't immediately be triggered when I was trying to get the book published. So I, I, I don't know if that change has been kind of reverted back into the Chinese edition. Perhaps not, uh, but I do know other changes uh, that were made in the English translation were then implemented into later editions of the Chinese. So yeah, um, it's I guess those are instances where the uh, editors over in the English side had a fair bit of free reign, but it's um, in some ways they weren't making creative choices, whereas you got the opportunity to kind of add some of your own imagery, which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, and uh, actually like what you mentioned about the um, uh, portrayal of like female characters, that was, um, I, I guess in particular, um, the, the character uh, Mu Jianyu. Um, yeah. The, uh, yeah, part of, a, a big part of the edits was um, kind of like how, how she was portrayed, not, Maybe not so much her, uh, like her as a you know a character and her actions, but just the, uh, the relevant descriptions. Um, yeah, yeah. There, there was a bit more of a, an emphasis on her. I guess you could say like her like feminine characteristics, which is something that's like a little bit more common in in Chinese writing. And I mean, I guess to be honest, like a lot of Western writing until maybe more recently. Um, mm -hmm. So, I yeah, and and, and with that there were uh, edits made to you know make her present her more as a, a member of the task force rather than like a female member of the task force yeah um I, it makes me think of the like lists buzzfeed makes of like hilarious uh, examples of men writing women and they often kind of go for those kind of weird or superfluous descriptions of, of their their bodies so right. i can understand as an editor not wanting to end up on one of those lists and being um you know the object of fun for all the readership of BuzzFeed. Going going back again to like uh, potential darkness. So the book, as the blurb kind of hinted that, deals with like kind of like vigilante justice and bad bad people in society that the law isn't touching, um, getting what they deserve. And some of the people are just like murderers who've gotten away with their crimes or there wasn't sufficient proof that they should be um, punished or whatever. But there are other people who are kind of like at the top of the uh, society, uh, wealthy people who've done uh, dodgy dealings. I don't think any people from the government get knocked off, but there are people who have like done business with government officials and, and, and whatnot. So what did you think of the handling of societal corruption? And were there any changes made there in the English edition? Um, well, I guess as far as changes and like uh, changes to um, humanities like targets, um, there weren't really any changes made there. Uh, and and I think that uh, it's definitely like, well, yeah, definitely like a, a bold move uh, to be, you know, targeting people like, like you know, within the police. Um, and who are like fairly high up in society. I, but I think uh, in doing so, it does like, I'm assuming like, you know, struck a chord with a lot of the readers. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it would do the same thing in uh, with, you know, really wherever you are. Uh, if you're reading it, uh, you probably are in a place where, uh, you know, a very, <laughs> very similar like situation is taking place, uh, you know, where there is like corruption throughout society at, at all different levels um kind of the uh maybe maybe it's going slightly off topic but uh the kind of like treatment of humanities and like his mission reminded me a little bit of um uh in the movie black panther um with the villain uh killmonger uh who I, i'm not sure if you've seen it i have seen it yeah watched uh, that in shanghai in, in uh, one of the cinemas inside the shopping mall yeah, so I mean, the way that I feel, and I, I think like a lot of the um, like a lot of members of the audience who saw Black Panther felt that like I mean, Killmonger is he is like almost the you could say like the justifiable hero of the movie, um, except he does like you know he was written to like cross the line 
a little bit too much into uh, I guess what you could say like is like you know being being evil and to murder, but you know still making like valid points. Um, and I feel like something similar might be going on with uh, Eumenides, where he is uh, you know making very valid points about the corruption uh, in society, how many people are given a pass uh, because of their wealth or their influence, which I guess in many cases are the same thing. Um, but because of, uh, you know, some of the actions that he's taken, starting with, I guess, when he was faking his own death, uh, you know, it also involved like a double like homicide, uh, you know, where you can't fully sympathize with him. Yeah, definitely like an ends justify the means sort of a guy. I, I was trying to think of an example like that where you have someone who is making absolutely correct criticisms of people or society, but then his, and then that you know takes it to murderous extremes. I couldn't think of any really good one for one examples, but the one that kept popping into my head was uh, Jigsaw from from Saw, the Saw films. Maybe just because um, he's got a cool name like Humanities, where it's like he's. Um, have you have you seen any of the Saw films? Uh, yeah, I've seen the uh, I think the the first two, uh, but um, I can definitely see a similarity. Um, yeah, the reason I was thinking of Jigsaw from Saw is he makes completely valid points about people's lives. He even gives them some good um, feedback on the way they could improve them their 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 lives. But he also uses an excuse to do absolutely horrific things to people's bodies and faces right. <laughs> a little bit like um our guy humanities is doing in this story yeah. although the way i'm saying that makes it sound like we get his point of view we absolutely don't he's like a shadowy uh, behind the scenes sort of figure all the way through which character in this story jumped out at you the most um well initially uh i guess initially it would be um Peitao or you know who was originally Luo Fei, um, mm. just you know, because he's the the protagonist of the novel, and as like a, a translator, I was like spending the most time with him. Uh, but I think um, as I as I went through like the edits um, and was you know making like slight slight tweaks to to some of the characters and making sure I was you know portraying them in the the best like I guess you could say most like, three dimensional way. Um, it was probably a toss up between. Uh, between like Mu Jianyun and uh, <clears throat> and uh, Zheng Ruhua, um, Mu mm. because uh, well, kind of for the reasons that, that I mentioned earlier, uh, being yeah the the only like female member of uh, the task force, um, I had to take a bit more like you know a, a bit of care uh, like when editing my like descriptions of her was you know, which were originally I uh, was trying to be like very faithful to the original novel and I know that like when she's first introduced the uh in, in the Chinese novel she's described as like a true southern beauty um <laughs> right so so the, these were things that uh had to be changed a little bit in uh <clears throat> in the English version um and uh also you know just being being conscious making sure that she is uh being presented as like being on the you know at the very least like equal footing um, with the rest of the task force. Uh, and then as for Tsung, um, he was like in many ways the comic relief uh, character. And um, as far as like my recollection of uh, the edits, uh, I think I made him much more like sarcastic in this version. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he was, yeah, definitely a bit sarcastic in the original, but uh, well, I, I think what I was doing was just kind of injecting my own sense of humor um into him and since a lot of his lines were like humorous there was definitely a lot of like tweaking that went on to get the right effect in translation right yeah the the, the, the so we should probably mention those two characters kind of end up as a duo they have quite a lot of scenes together so to speak mm -hmm. and i those are some of my favorite bits because those were very much about the characters quite a lot they were each a, a kind of a cool thing about the team in the the, the book is uh, it's different points they're all trying to work their own angle either for mm -hmm. their own reasons or because they think it's the best way to solve the crime and yeah the the way that those two 
So we should probably mention Zung is ineptly trying to hit on uh, Mu the whole time and she's mm. having none of it basically. Or when she's not having none of it, she's humoring him because she can't be bothered or because she's trying to get something out of him, which could potentially be really icky, but um, it's all handled pretty tastefully. And I think I've now learned probably a lot of credit there uh, goes to you because both, well, obviously Zung's not supposed to be completely likable, but he came off as funny rather than icky. And Mu came off as a pretty well-rounded um, character, I think. It seemed to be striking a good balance between... I think she's she's written to be like an attractive, smart woman, mm -hmm. but she's not reduced to that at all in, in the English version, which is which was, was nice. Because I, I kept worrying, oh no, is this going to get... Is this going to cross the line and am I, go am I going to be fed up with the author? But it, it never happened. So yeah, I think good job there. Yeah, thanks. And it's definitely due to a lot of that worrying uh, occurring, like both on, on my behalf and like the uh, the head editor's uh, behalf. So right. definitely <laughs> took a lot of care there. So our next set of questions are the kind of publishing and translation related questions. I guess we've already gone into this a lot. So I'm just going to go through these. And if, if we're if we looks like we might be repeating ourselves, well, let's not bother repeating ourselves, but here we go. So uh, I've mentioned already that I've got the Head of Zeus edition of the book, the UK and possibly Commonwealth-wide uh, version. And I've, I'm assuming they, they bought those rights from Doubleday. Perhaps they got them directly from uh, the Chinese, the acronym, <laughs> the CEP, CEPIEC, yeah. yeah, possibly from them, I don't know. Um, but what I want to ask is, so I mentioned earlier that Head of Zeus, they are going out of their way to try and publish more like kind of crime uh, books from China. They're trying to make like a China crime list to go alongside their Chinese sci-fi list. So do you think publishers like them and maybe also Amazon Crossing, who've got a few similar books, do you think they're going to find a lot of um, sales, I guess? Do you think they're going to strike gold doing this? Or do you think the market uh, for crime and, and detective stuff from China is a little bit uh, limited? Uh, well, I mean, just in, uh, because well, I guess like, uh, like, I, like I've, I've mentioned uh, before, I'm not like uh, super well versed with the, like the landscape of uh, Chinese crime fiction, but um, mm -hmm. I believe in, yeah, I, I believe and I'm sure that the publishers are aware of this too, but that the successful, uh, sorry, I believe that the success of the Three Body series, I mean, really helped put like popular Chinese fiction on the map as far as international audiences are concerned. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that it's uh, like a thought in the back of these publishers' minds that they're trying to find kind of the their like Three Body uh, series, but like in the the crime genre. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, in in general, I mean, I I know that there is a lot of uh, a lot of good like Chinese fiction out there, a lot of great like Chinese genre fiction out there. Um, so it's really just a matter of like finding like that book or uh, like that series that kind of like catches the like international imagination in the same way. And I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that the uh, like the translation of, of this book of, of Death Notice was like, you know, since it was the same company handling the copyright, uh, like the foreign translation copyrights, yeah, um, it was also you know spurred by the success of uh, like the Three Body series and the interest in that. Yeah, I think I think you could be right. Um, a thing I it's certainly not a secret, but it takes it's it's you have to look a little bit to find this. Um, the kind of the people who got the ball rolling on getting Three Body into English, it was uh, C mm -hmm. I keep it was them that got the ball rolling so yeah there's like a, a mutual interest on both sides in making these things uh blow up for you know just for obvious reasons there's so much in in a world where it's going to get harder and harder to uh, ignore uh, <laughs> ignore china yeah. it's um it's pretty important that uh, some of these things happen and um, what you're saying about trying to find the next three body series that really makes sense um thinking about the books that head of zeus do because the other crime Chinese crime book I read from them, the Hong Kong one, Second Sister, that's the first in a series too. And this, well, not, not intending any spoilers here, um, I guess we've already mentioned this, but right at the end of uh, Death Notice, there's a huge setup for book two. It's really, it's, it's uh, makes absolutely no, um, 
it lets you make no mistake that there is supposed to be a sequel for this book. And I've seen online that um, I think you can already pre-order book two, uh, Fate, I think. Mm. It's certainly like the cover art and, and pages on publishers' websites. They're, they're all up there now. Yeah, and I think I was actually just checking because the last time I saw it was set to be published later this year, but it looks like it's been pushed back to February. Right. But yeah, I mean, it, it does it does also make sense if you are going to be, um, you know, investing in the translation of, of a book and trying to uh, build up a big audience for it. I guess it does make sense that you would be um, looking for, you know, looking at like a series, some kind of franchise, something where you could like, you know, continue to gather attention as, uh, you know, as each edition um, or as, as each installment in the series comes out. Uh, and, and I was just thinking of, well, I mean, in uh, crime fiction, I, I haven't read it, but I mean, the, uh, what's it called? The, the Millennium series by uh, Stieg Larsson. Yeah, um, the, the I mean, girl who kicked the hornet's nest. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, there's like, you know, massive interest in, uh, you know, in the, well, in the U.S. or just among English speaking audiences for that. And the fact that, you know, it's, uh, it's a series that you can latch on to um, makes it a bit more I guess a bit more accessible uh, where you don't have to like, you know, keep looking for different examples of uh, um, like Nordic crime fiction if you, if you don't want to. Um, so it's probably a similar approach, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's a kind of a parallel with three body in that it was uh, on one hand enjoyed just for what it was a great story in a particular genre, but also looked at as kind of representative of, of the country it's from. So mm-hmm. I think there's, probably a lot to uh, looking at it in that way a next technical question can you recall any kind of interesting linguistic problems that you hit upon while working on this book i think one that uh really like stands out in my memory is uh not not the translation of like you know a certain term so much as uh just like a difference in writing style um and i remember that in the original uh there is like a fairly frequent use of uh use of like adverbs um especially mm-hmm. like in relations or in relation to like to speaking to i mean these are just examples off the top of my head or you know to say like, you know, like he said he said slyly or, or something like that um and i am uh, i'm i am a big fan of adverb uh, yeah well I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of stephen king's uh on writing book in yeah. which he mentioned he stresses that point i was just about to google uh the the bit from that because it's really funny I, I know exactly the part you mean yeah i mean I, I can't remember how many times i've i've read it but it's deeply ingrained in 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 my head um so i uh i know in my in my first um version i definitely did like keep some of the adverbs in there but tried to um make them a little bit less glaring and and part of this is i mean not saying that like oh you know the original like wasn't you know written uh properly or wasn't written well uh, part of it's just the difference between well yeah the linguistic difference um and how like adverbs are seen in in english and in english writing mm-hmm. um, and yeah. and as well as differences between cultures like if you look back at um different kinds of writing from different eras different styles kind of go in and out and not not to say that one's better or the other but like um pe- people's tastes change so you know who knows maybe two year 200 years in the future people are going to look back on um writers from our era or our generation and think oh gosh there was a what a strange period in um english writing where everyone insisted on having very plain adverb free prose <laughs> you know what i mean um it's just yeah. what works for one set of readers and reads as good and not flowery or silly won't work for the others so yeah um i i see absolutely no kind of contradiction in doing a faithful translation and getting rid of those adverbs because if it's supposed to read as like fairly serious and um clean then you wouldn't want loads of like slyly sneakily cleverly it looks a bit kind of primary school in english i think just by the standards and tastes of uh, today yeah and uh also one one thing that the uh the editing team like stressed for this was um well just really to make this uh, a bit more of a I guess you could say like a uh, like a terser read um just cutting out um you know certain like 
small uh, sentences or, or or paragraphs, like small paragraphs that didn't really advance the plot or or advance the the pace, just to make sure it was like a very fast moving story, which is something that uh, I think a lot of uh, you know the English speaking readers were expecting. Um, so again, yeah. like a, a genre expectation. Yeah, um, this is something that's popped up a few times um, on, on the podcast and reading about um, translations of Chinese works and, and, and whatnot. Um, it seems like books in China are one, often quite a lot bigger in terms of word count than English mm-hmm. language books, and two, aren't line edited, so like edited in terms of prose nearly as uh, heavily. Um, I think the consensus I've kind of gathered is that the editor, like the power, if, if, if we were like doing superheroes or top trump cards or something, the power of the author is quite a lot higher in proportion to the editor in China, whereas in the English language publishing or market or whatever, editors have got more authority and power over their um, their authors. So if you really want, it seems like often, if, if you really want to good, do a good job bringing a book both into uh, the English language, but also the English language market, um, the translator has to take on a little bit of the editor role because that because there's like a gap between English language market editing and Chinese language market editing. There's some kind of leftover slack that could be tightened, uh, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's definitely um, something that was like a, a big concern uh during the editing process just to make it like as as tight a read as possible yeah well it is a very tight read so i guess um mission accomplished yeah i think that's um all my kind of main questions done with so now we're going to go into the the miscellaneous odds and ends uh, miscellaneous odds and ends section so first thing i'm going to ask is could you suggest uh like a word of the day for us a, a chinese word of the day relevant to the story sure yeah so let's see i think I think one that is pretty relevant to uh, the plot of the book and also just like fairly useful in general uh, is the word uh, shicha, um, which literally means like time difference. Um, and, mm. it, you know, commonly used to refer to like uh, the difference between uh, time zones in, in different countries. Um, I used it, like heard it a lot, you know, to refer to like uh, the jet lag that I felt after uh, traveling like back and forth you know, between the uh, between the U.S. and China, um, but as you and uh, you know, listeners who have read the book might be able to guess, um, the shicha really comes into play with that uh, really important two-minute time difference. Mm. So yeah, and that, that's why I suggested that word. So shicha, shi being time, cha mm-hmm. being difference. Right. Got it. Cool. Yeah, that's it. this is actually something I forgot to mention is the level of detail and like kind of logical planning out of events where that Joe Hahui must have done um, where he's he's figured out down to the minute how an event would have happened and then how people interpreting that event would have one figured out details or yeah found this two minute time difference and then analyzed it and used it to get a better picture of what happened and whatnot all the kind of logic of things is is really impressive that's the really uh, big feat I think of the book is these kind of logical puzzles that he would have worked out, I guess, in the planning stage and then built uh, a plot and dramatic events around. But yeah, something I, I really forgot to mention that I talked about in that uh, bonus episode I pre-recorded um, was about the reception of the book on Doban. The, um, so like I, I actually mentioned this in the last interview I did. Doban, you, you probably know this. I'm more talking to the listeners. It's kind of like Chinese imdb but it also is like chinese goodreads it has a book section movie section i think there's a music section too but it's a really good place to find out what chinese readers thought of a book so i i said in that last interview as well um my chinese reading level is not even good enough to read a a a comment or review on doban so i'm usually unless there's something that the translator auto translation didn't catch um i'll be reading the whole thing using google auto translation but even then it gives me a really interesting view of what um chinese readers are kind of thinking of a book and i noticed that a lot of the comments whether they were positive or negative about uh, this book or about the kind of logical skill that joe ha hui has so some were saying wow he's um he's really scientific and logical in the way he works out the plot and the events mm. And that makes it a high quality work, which is good because I think they were saying that it seems like the kind of 
quote-unquote quality level of some Chinese crime is in question, the, the, the reviewers seem to be saying that some of the works they've enjoyed aren't as logical, and they wanted uh, crime books from China to be more logical. And mm -hmm. for some of them, they were seeing Zhou Hui as like a genius in like the kind of just logistics of how the investigations and the crimes work. And there were some other people who weren't so happy with the, the, the logistics um, of how everything happened. But I just thought it was interesting that that's where the focus was. I could see that being very similar in other like crime fiction in general. But again, I'm a bit of an ignoramus. I, I, I don't know. But um, yeah, I, did did you have to worry about any of that as a translator? Just the, the a precise description of events and chronology and characters, knowledge and point of view and stuff like that? Uh, well, with, with that, I was uh, definitely fortunate to have uh, like uh, an editor to like keep me honest and um, right. to, to really call out because, yeah, I mean, as a, uh, you know, as, as like a, a writer or, well, more accurately, in this case, you know, the translator uh, with, with my nose, like really deep in the actual like writing itself, um, mm. it's sometimes, yeah, it, it's easy to, uh, to lose sight of certain things if, uh, you know, like a certain, you know, detail uh, causes a, a, a conflict with the actual, you know, the way that the events are laid out. Um, or if something is uh, even like, you know, removed or slightly changed during the editing process that like later conflicts with something. Yeah, the, the editor like Robert did a like a really good job of pointing out any contradictions that arose. Uh, and even in some cases, I think, uh, suggesting ways that it could be um, could be tightened. Um, or I believe like made a little bit clearer in some cases. Um, mm. yeah. and what, uh, what you mentioned about like the Chinese reception of the book that like was definitely, I mean, that's definitely really interesting to hear. Also, I mean, what I was, what I was thinking as you were, uh, you know, describing those reactions, I was thinking about why people might approach this genre, why, why people might be drawn to crime fiction. Um, I guess, you know, why Chinese readers might be drawn to it versus uh, why, um, like English speaking readers uh, might, might go for crime fiction because, you know, in, in some cases they might have a uh, slightly different like foundation. Um, a lot of, let's say like you know, American uh, crime readers uh, might, might get into it because I don't know if they listen to like a lot of true crime podcasts or, uh, you mm -hmm. know, certain like movies that they'd watch. Um, whereas, um, and this is all like speculation, but I don't know, um, some, Chinese readers might get into the genre for for different reasons. It could be the like the logical uh, aspect of it, which is definitely a you know part of uh, I think crime fiction in general. Um, I mean, you have like you know Sherlock Holmes, and uh, which is full of of logic. Um, but yeah, I'm sure everyone has their different reasons. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's it's a, a line I walk on the podcast is. Um, occasionally trying to indulge in some kind of like a speculation or generalization about um, Chinese readers this or blah blah this blah blah that but then also not wanting to um, to be making things up or, or generalizing too much uh, but yeah it's it's, it's tricky because it is so fun to, to speculate about stuff like that I, I guess as well the Chinese internet being what it is if there was a a, a commenter who said wanted to write something like this doesn't nearly get into the absolute depths of uh, corruption in in Chinese cities. Humanity should be going after the head of the province <laughs> or something. that. You know that's an invisible review. We'll, yeah. we'll never read that one on yeah. Doban. So uh, whereas stuff about the the logic is is a bit safer. So there's my stupid generalization there. My um, mm. taking a shot at the, the Chinese internet censorship. But yeah, um, we're getting a bit too serious. Let's become silly again. All if right. if notice was a drink. What kind of drink would it be? And I should say here, um, soft, hard, and hot drinks are accepted. It doesn't always have to be booze, but if it is, that's good. <laughs> see, um, I, I would say uh, if Death Notice was a drink, at least for me, it would be uh, black coffee because that is mm. what fueled, I'd say, about like ninety-five percent of my translation. Right. And just the fact that it is, it is a, a thriller. It is a page turner. It's always keeping you on your toes. Um, so it is, I guess, kind of like a version of literary caffeine. Yeah, I think that's a very fair description. I certainly got through it very quickly as well, possibly sped up by, by caffeine. Uh, yeah, so that's all my, my fun, silly questions done. Here's your self promo slot. So if, if listeners want to find out more about yourself or things you've done, is there anywhere we can direct them? 
Yeah, well, I guess, um, I mean, you could find me on, um, on LinkedIn uh, for sure, uh, though that's a little more like professionally oriented, but um, let's see, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, recently, I haven't been tweeting a lot, although I'm constantly checking it uh, and, you know, liking different tweets. Um, and I do have my own website, which is just like my last name, Halusa. Uh, dot dev um, and that's that's mostly just to kind of put myself out there as a, a software engineer but um, yeah I mean I, I would say if anyone is interested in um, like chatting uh, with me uh, or asking questions about um, you know translation uh, software engineering or uh, God forbid politics uh, feel free to just get in touch with me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn there you go cool yeah I was thinking when you were describing um going from translation to coding and you were saying the two things aren't really connected and I was trying to think is there some smarty pants way I can say how right getting in like language commands into code language is like getting stuff from Chinese into English and I thought no there's there's just too much scope to embarrass myself here I, I won't do it but yeah um right so the, the next question I had written down here was a complete typo it's it was me me planning to ask you about where readers, uh, where listeners can read Wuxia online. Obviously, that's not a question um, intended for you. Um, I would be interested. In, in yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, WuxiaWorld.com. That's where you want to go for 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 that. But yeah, um, I guess we could direct the listeners to where they can get their hands on Death Notice and maybe pre-order the, the sequel. And I guess the answer is like Amazon or your favorite bookshop or your favorite online book vendor. It's pretty widely available, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's that's where at least that's where I would go here in the U.S. to uh, uh, maybe my local Barnes and Noble, uh, you know, or, or any any big bookstore, or just off Amazon. But yeah. Um. Last question for you. Uh, what are you reading just now? Well, I guess if you if you ask me, like over the past year, it would mostly be uh, like technical documentation, uh, just mm. for kind of making that transition into software engineering. But um, I have been uh, so I've. I felt embarrassed uh, for a while because I was a really avid reader through high school and through a, a big part of um, of college, and you know even when I was in China reading um, both like English and Chinese books. But recently, I've been reading so much. So I, but one um, one book that I have been like uh, picking up, and I, I guess I'm like mostly through, is uh, a book called uh, Exit West. Um, and I don't want to mispronounce the author's name, but um, I believe you'd say it, uh, uh, most in Hamid. Um, right. and it's, uh, it touches on topics, uh, like immigration and refugees, uh, with a slightly more, uh, fantastical approach just with, it's about, um, well, these doors, uh, that start appearing in certain places, like, uh, you know, a, a door that leads to like a different city or a different country. Um, mm. And about the uh, yeah the well the emigration um, that kind of uh, results from this or you know the and um, you know unrest in in certain locations and I think this is it's definitely a timely read um, well and especially probably like pre COVID might be a little bit more timely because it's all about people moving around um, but. <laughs> It's definitely one that I would recommend to, if, I mean, if it sounds interesting uh, to you, I would definitely recommend reading it. Um, maybe a bonus uh, kind of something that I'm reading and a, a recommendation. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm getting back into um, reading uh, like Chinese just through the, like starting from the beginning of the uh, Grave Robber Chronicles. Um, Mm. And I would recommend that to anyone who is uh, looking for like a Chinese language read, maybe, you know, whether it's uh, just something enjoyable to read or if they're, you know, still learning and are looking for a challenge. Um, mm. Because those, like I mentioned, they are kind of like fast paced reads, but they also do deal with a lot of, uh, I guess you could say like historical or like archaeological terms um, that if you're interested in, in in the genre, I think would be would be interesting. Kind of in the same way that reading the uh, Chinese like language version of the Three Body series is a good introduction to a lot of scientific terms. Right. I just um, popped um, Grave Robbers Chronicles into Google, and it seems like on Amazon.co.uk there's um, there's a translation available. All all six books seem to be in um, 
English. So anyone who who wants to read the English ones, I think I think the publishing world has you covered. But for anyone who wants to take your suggestion and、uh, read the Chinese original, what's what's the Chinese name of the Grave Robbers Chronicles?、Uh, the Chinese name would be、uh, Dao Mu Bi Ji. Okay, awesome. Yeah, if anyone's interested. Excellent. Well, that's me all out of questions、uh, for you, Zach. Is there anything else、um, you want to say before I? Um, say thank you and bid you farewell. No, I think、uh, yeah, that's that's mostly that's just about it for me.、Uh, so yeah, I, I've definitely enjoyed having the chance to、uh, talk to you, Angus, about、um, about Death Notice,、uh, about my translation experience, and just translation and literature in general.、Uh, mm. Definitely glad that、uh, you found me on Twitter. Yes,、um, I'm glad.、Uh, I'm glad I was able to find you. Twitter has been. The best place for finding、uh, show guests, I guess, because everyone's on it,、um, and everyone. It's not like Facebook. It's not weird if I follow people on Twitter, like it would be if I just added them out of the blue on Facebook. Yeah, I mean, right now,、uh, Twitter is really the.、Uh, it's really the only like I guess you could say like general social media that I use.、Uh, there is LinkedIn, although that's mostly for finding jobs.、Um, but kind of like yeah, for me, Twitter works as kind of an like all-purpose social media. Ending on those、uh, ruminations on Twitter, I'm gonna say thanks and stop the recording. All right, that's your show. Now it's time for the plugs. Now I'm going to do these、uh, nice and efficiently. I'm hoping as well. Although we, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. I do have a tendency to wander down、uh, oral alleyways. That sounded horrible, didn't it? Oral alleyways. Anyway,、um, so social media first. Let's do that. So places you can. Give me feedback on episodes, things you liked, didn't like so much,、uh, any key facts you think me or my guest missed for any episode. Social media is a great way to to、um, get in touch to to relay relay those various things. So I、uh, the show's Twitter is just my Twitter, and that's at Angus Likes Words. The show has an official Instagram account. It is at Trichufic T R C H F I C. Uh, there's also a Discord where you can talk with other people on the show. It's been a bit quiet lately, so I'd love to see more back and forth on there. But you know, I, I can't wave a wand to make that happen. That's down to you guys, of course. I'm thinking of making a subreddit, although I think that you know I don't know if we've really got enough people and enough activity to justify that. But it's something at the back of my mind now. So let me know if that would interest you. But yeah, that's that. Okay, to、um, make me rich. JK to help support the show and、um, help me、uh, cover hosting fees and things like that. You can go to two places. There's Patreon, where from as little as one USD per month, you can access the bonus shows. I've got、uh, lots of these queued up for the coming month. We've got something like 35 episodes now.、Uh, I've done kind of like warm-up episodes for.、Um, A lot of the shows I've covered, so I had like a warm up one for this one, a warm up one for an upcoming episode on Last Quarter of the Moon, and I have a really cool,、uh, creepy, crazy one lined up for Halloween. So, you know, spooky people, there's something there for you. If you are horrified by the idea of money coming out of your bank account every month, and who wouldn't be? There's a place where you can give like a one-off contribution, and that is buymeacoffee.com, and it does what it says on the tin, really. So both of those ones, you just enter the website's name and stick、uh, slash trichufic on the end, T R C H F I C. So patreon.com slash trichufic, buymeacoffee.com slash trichufic.、Uh, links for those are on the show's main homepage on Podbean. So they're all there. Another thing、um, I should have probably announced at the start of the show actually is transcripts for the show. We have four of them now. Three I made myself. One、uh, Yilin Wang、uh, got a pro to do, and that's on her website. I have links to them all on a WordPress I made for the show.、Uh, that's linked to from from the show's homepage. But yeah, we now have transcripts for episode one, episode two, episode twenty one, which is the one about Han Song and the mass,、uh, the the creator and the passengers, or the passengers and the creator. Sorry. And、uh, the Yilin Wang one—that's the one about the woman in the carriage. I forget the exact number, but it's one of the Wuxia episodes. So, if you like to consume podcasts as text, well, we have four of those now that you can read rather than listen to. Now, the most important thing is how you can spread the word about the show. So, if you know someone who might be interested—be it a friend, a colleague, a boss, or indeed your、um, your fellow. Team on the the homicide crew who you've been trying to hit on awkwardly. You could recommend the show to them, but please don't do it as a way to try and hit on them or chat them up. That would number one. 
be a bad move. And number two, it would something that we would have to run by our um, our editor and our translator just to make sure it's appropriate for the market. You know, we've got to take that into consideration. So yeah, until next episode and until we catch the killer, Zaijian. Bye.